In today's movie, I'm going to talk about creating new classes using Python 3. As usual, we'll start by going to my homepage and click on Schedule and click on the current schedule. Currently we're in the fall 2017 semester. You click on any of these links to go to the schedule for this course. Now, if you scroll down to week 12, you'll see that the topic is Introduction to Classes. If you click here, it'll take you to a PDF file and you'll be able to uh, look at that file on any mobile device. Or so, I'm going to click here, and now this particular file is in about, uh, we've got 63 pages on this document. Uh, in part one, I'll cover the first 30 pages, and in part two, we'll cover uh, the remaining pages of this document in a separate video. So, Introduction to Object Oriented Programming, also known as OOP. Now, Python is a structured programming language. It uses sequences, and these are statements executed in order. We have decisions, uh, we've been using the if statement, and looping, which is repetition, we use the for statement and the while statement. And these are all organized to aid understanding of the program and make it easy to modify the program. Now, Python supports multiple programming styles programming style is also known as a paradigm and these paradigms include imperative which means imperative means issuing commands to tell the computer what to do procedural means using functions and we've been using programmer defined functions in our code and so these paradigms are used to organize and simplify programs so it's a structured programming technique now, procedural programming includes imperative and structured programming paradigms. Now, in this course, we started right from the beginning using structured imperative programming, and then we went on to use programming uh, in a procedural paradigm using pr uh, programmer-defined functions. Now, we're going to learn about object-oriented programming. This is a really important programming technique and it will help to simplify complicated programs. Now, this style, object-oriented programming, was first introduced at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the 1950s. And the idea of object-oriented programming, it gained momentum in the 70s, and in the early 80s, Bjorn Strustrup integrated object-oriented programming into the C language and he called the resulting language C++. And C++ became the very first object-oriented language to be used widely commercially. And here I've got a link to Bjorn Strustrup and a picture of also myself at the conference at SFU, Simon Fraser University, in 2009. And uh, Bjorn gave a, a talk on the C++ language and going back to where I was. So, object-oriented programming, it was widely used after the development of C++ by Bjorn Strustrup. And in the early 90s, a group at Sun Microsystems, led by James Gosling, developed a simpler version of C++, which they called Java. And this language was developed into a language for programming internet applications it gained popularity as the internet boomed and the language was chosen by Google to develop mobile Android apps. Now the Python language was first developed in 1989 by Guido van Rossum and by 1990 had the capability for object-oriented programming. So Python was designed with object-oriented programming in mind. So what is it? What is an object? So, to know what it is, object-oriented programming, you need to know what an object is. And an object is a thing. It's an entity. And using objects, 
we've already been using objects. We've been using different types of object on this course already. For example, integers, strings, lists, floats, boolean, file. These are all objects. We can create objects of these types. So how do we make an integer object? This is how. We assign 10 to a variable age. And if you print the type of age, type will give you the data type of age. And if you issue this command, it's going to output class int. Now, straight away you can see that a data type is a class. If you assign 10 to age, age is an integer object. Its class is int. In the same way, you can make a float object. You can make a string object. You can make a Boolean object. And you can make a list object. Now, a data type then is a class. And notice that all the built-in data types, such as int, float, string, etc., these are known as classes. And a class has actions associated with it. For example, if you've got an integer object or a float object, you can use the plus operator or minus, multiply and divide. And you can, if you have a list object, then list objects have actions built in and they're built into their methods. So for example, you can sort a list, you can capitalize a string object and you can close a file object. So a class's methods can change the state of an object. So for example, if you've got a list, you want to sort the list, you can use the sort method. And this is how you would sort a list object by calling the sort method on the list object by separating with a dot. And here we, we can um, create or we can use the upper method on a string to convert a string to uppercase. So in summary, class objects have their own name and they have a data type and there are methods that we can use on these objects. Every object belongs to a class. And an object is said to be an instance of a class. Earlier on we saw the age. Uh, age was assigned 10. Age is an instance of the integer class. Now Python lets you to create your own objects, sorry, your own classes from which you can create objects. So just like there are built-in functions like print and string and functions that you can make yourself, then there are also built-in classes and classes that you can define yourself. But why would you want to create your own classes? Well, why would you want to make your own function to make life easier for the programmer? So as your programs get bigger, keeping track of data gets more difficult. Say, for example, you're storing data on students in a computer science course. You may use a list to store all the data for the student name, course code, student number, scores, etc. And after a while, you may decide you want to store extra data. So, for example, date of birth or city of residence. And then you've got to go back into your list and make some changes and you may have to make changes in many places to make allowance for the extra data that you're going to store. So if you're working with a team of programmers and you give your program to somebody else, it may be difficult for the new programmer to be able to figure out exactly what's going on in your program, how your data is stored. So creating your own student class simplifies your program. So the whole, the whole idea of a class is to make your program simpler, easier to understand, easier to change, easier to track errors. So at this point in the document, I'm going to stop. And in the next part of this topic, Introduction to object oriented Programming, I'll continue to finish off the remainder of this PDF document.